Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video with Swagglehaas. Happy New Year. Can you guys believe it? We are now in 2023. I can't believe it, but here we are, January 1st. And you know what that means. On January 1st, last couple of years, I've made this type of video, which is what books to spec on for whatever year before it's too late. So in this video, we're going to go throughout the calendar year. We're going to take a look at all of the movies, all of the TV shows coming out, and talk about what books may have relevance to those shows or movies when they roll around. But before I get into the video, if you guys could drop me a like or a comment or subscribe if you're enjoying the content, help support the channel, do one of those things I would appreciate but let us get into this video here today. Now, of course, I gotta do a little bit of a preface. This is not financial advice. This is me not telling you guys what books to buy. This is me just trying to create a resource and a guide so you guys can be better informed and make your own decisions. We don't know what's happening with comic books right now. We don't know what's happening in the economic market. Things might be different by the time we get to some of the properties later on in the year. Who really knows? So always make sure you guys are buying what you like and make sure you get a really great deal if you decide to pick up any of these books. Last little preface, of course, is that I'm not gonna to talk about every single book that relates to every single TV show. We're just going to talk about the books that I think are going to have the market's eyes on it when we get to those properties. So with that being said, let us get into the first property coming out this year. And the first property coming out this year is Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania, which is set to release in February. And of course, the first book we have to talk about for this film is going to be Marvel premiere number 47 from 1979. And what is the significance of this? Well, of course, this is the first appearance of Scott Lang as Ant-Man. Now, you guys know Scott Lang. That is the Ant-Man version that Paul Rudd plays. He is set to make his return in this film, and this will be the third installment for his particular franchise. And I think this book is a very solid, affordable Bronze Age key with a lot of room to go. I think that Ant-Man is going to have not only a big role, of course, in his own film, but I do think that we are going to see Paul Rudd's character many more times in the MCU moving forward. Uh, whatever information he gets or gains from, you know, Quantumania, he's going to need to relay that information to the other Avenger characters. So we know we're going to see him again later on when we get to Kang Dynasty and certainly Secret Wars. Now, additionally, on top of the Ant-Man appearance. You also have the first appearance of Cassie Lang. She is also going to play a part in this movie. And additionally, you have the first appearance of Darren Cross, who is also going to play a part in this movie as a different character that we are going to discuss in a second. All right, the next book we have to talk about for Quantum Mania is of course going to be Avengers number eight from 1964. And what is the significance of this? Well, you guys know this is the first appearance of Kang the Conqueror. Now we all know that Jonathan Majors is going to be playing Kang the Conqueror. And for all intents and purposes, it seems like he is going to be the big bad for the entire multiverse saga, which means starting with Quantumadia, we are going to see him again and again and again. He is rumored to be showing up later on in Loki season two, which of course we will be talking about in this video as well. It is also currently speculated that not only will he be the big bad of Kang Dynasty, he might also be a variant version of himself known as the Beyonder in Secret War. So no matter how you slice it, we are going to be getting a ton of Kang the Conqueror starting with Quantumania. And in my opinion, this is going to be a good book to own for many, many years. All right, the next book we got to talk about for Quantum Media is, of course, Tales of Suspense number 94 from 1967. And what is the significance of this? Well, of course, you guys know this is the first appearance of the character known as MODOK. Now, remember, I mentioned Darren Cross. If you guys remember, Darren Cross was the villain of the Ant-Man 1 film. And in that film, he was actually playing the villain known as Yellow Jacket. But it's currently been rumored that Darren Cross is making a return in the quantum realm. But when he does make his appearance, he's going to be taking up the role in mantle of MODOK. We got a toy leak from a Funko release that actually showed Darren Cross as MODOK. Now, it might be one of those situations that it's a one and done with him being kind of the main villain and Kang being sort of the side villain, but I actually think that the MCU probably has plans for MODOK later on down the line. Of course, there's a lot of storylines that they can utilize with him uh, if they want to bring back the AIM organization. There's a lot of connections that MODOK can have if they want to connect him to the power broker or do other storylines with Hydra in the future. So whatever they decide to do with him, I still think that this is going to be a good book for the long term. Now, the next book we got to talk about for Quantumania is kind of an interesting one. This one kind of came out of nowhere. And the book I'm talking about is Incredible Hulk number 156 from 1972. And what is the significance of this? Well, of course, this is the first appearance and only appearance for that matter of a character known as Kryler. Now, Kryler has basically been confirmed to be the character that Bill Murray is going to be playing when we get to Quantumania. Now, I do think that this is a very interesting 
interesting book, one that got heavily speculated on when those rumors started to come out onto the market. I'm not really sure what the legs for this book is, but I thought it would be important to bring it up to you guys just for informational purposes. Now, the next book we have to talk about is kind of a two for situation here, but the one I'm going to highlight first is Astonishing Ant-Man number six from 2015. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of Cassie Lang as the character known as Stinger. Stinger is what was revealed to be her purple costume that we did in fact see her in the Ant-Man Quantumania trailer with. Now, I also want to highlight Young Avengers number six. That's the first appearance of Cassie Lang as Stature. And it's been rumored that Stature is going to be the name that she plays in the film. So it's kind of a one-two punch here, sort of a Monica Rambeau spectrum situation, if you guys know that situation. But I'm going to leave it to you guys. These are two books that relate to Cassie Lang. I don't necessarily think either of these books are going to the moon. I do think that they have some potential for the future. And the last two books that we have to talk about for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania are two classic books right here. Ones that, you know, you don't really have to spec on these books, but they're going to be great investment buys if you have them for the long term anyways. But the two books I felt like I had to bring up were, of course, Tales to Astonish number 27 and Tales to Astonish number 44. Of course, Tales to Astonish number 27 is the first appearance of Hank Pym, otherwise known as the Ant-Man. And Tales to Astonish 44 is the first appearance of the Wasp, Janet Van Dyne, played by Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer. Let me know in the comments if you guys know that reference. But both of these books have been very underrated in the market for a long time. And I like that these books have low census counts, which typically means that, you know, you're going to be able to kind of buy, hold, and over the course of the long term, there's not going to be too many paper handed individuals who, you know, undercut your value and your price in the future. All right, let's move on now to the next property set to release in 2023. And of course, we have to talk about what if season two scheduled to be coming out? Well, they haven't really said yet, but apparently this is going to be a show that comes out earlier in the year. And I think that, you know, somewhere around that March and April time frame makes a lot of sense. But of course, the first book we have to talk about for What If Season 2 is going to be Fantastic Four number 13 from 1963. And what is the significance of this? Now, of course, this is the first appearance of the character known as The Watcher. Now, you guys know The Watcher. The Watcher is played or voiced by Jeffrey Wright. He is the person who narrates the show. I could see a world where they do decide to bring Jeffrey Wright right into the live action universe. Perhaps the Avengers are going to need to talk to the Watcher to get some information about Kang the Conqueror once we get to, you know, Kang Dynasty or Secret Wars. I mean, at the end of the day, it's an early Fantastic Four and you get the bonus first appearance of the Red Ghost. What's not to love about that? All right, the next book we got to talk about for the What If Show is of course going to be Captain Carter number one from 2022. And what is the significance of this? Well, that would be the first appearance of Captain Carter in comics. Now, there is also a 1 in 25 variant that you can see on the lower right side of your screen. That is actually the cover that is sort of the most accurate depiction of the character, you know, with the what if style of animation. And I think that these two books are going to be very important for the Captain Carter character moving forward. We saw her in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, and there's rumors that we're going to see her again in some other MCU property, even beyond what if, uh, possibly a live action series that she might have herself. And I think that these two books are going to be the go-to books for this character, but I'll let you guys decide which one you would like to pick up. All right, the next book we got to talk about for what if is kind of a interesting spec book, but this one right here is Marvel 1602, number one from 2003. And what is the significance of this? Well, of course, this is the first appearance of the 1602 Marvel Universe written by Neil Gaiman. This would actually be Neil Gaiman's first Marvel Comics work, so kind of a cool factor onto itself. But why am I bringing it up here? Well, it has been rumored and sort of leaked out that one of the episodes of What If Season 2 is going to be taking place in the 1602 universe, and I imagine that we're going to get some interesting things from this particular storyline. So I do think that this is a cool book and worth sort of bringing up to you guys here in this video. Now, the last three books I want to talk about for the What If show are kind of linked all together based in sort of the same speculation. But the first one I want to talk about is Journey into Mystery number 99 from 1963. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first full appearance 
of the character known as Surtur. Now, you guys remember Surtur, the one that would bring Ragnarok to Asgard. We saw him in the Thor Ragnarok film, and there were actually leaked storyboards and elite animatic that came out for What If Season 2 that actually showed Surtur having an episode surrounding him. Maybe there will be some eyes that move to this book at that particular episode. It also has the first appearance of Mr. Hyde, a great B-tier villain. Now, similarly, the other book I wanted to talk about was Journey into Mystery number 102 from 1963, which is the first appearance of the character known as Hela. Now, Hela was the main villain of Thor Ragnarok, played by Kate Blanchett, and at the San Diego Comic-Con teaser trailer for What If, we did in fact see Hela make an appearance in it. So we do know that she is going to have an episode in the What If show. If we rewind the clock to What If season one, when they brought Ultron back into it, you know, that kind of started to have, you know, a little bit of market attention toward Avengers number 55. So I think similar things could happen for Journey into Mystery 99, Journey into Mystery 102, and this book right here, Tales of Suspense number 50 from 1964. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of the Mandarin. In the San Diego Comic-Con teaser trailer, we also saw images of Wenwu, otherwise known as the Mandarin, in the What If show. So we know that the Mandarin is going to get an episode as well. And I actually think that the Mandarin could play a role in the MCU still moving forward. Currently, it seems like the Ten Rings have some importance. Those things could be linked to Kang the Conqueror. I think that it's interesting that the Shang-Chi director, Daniel Dustin Creighton, is going to be directing the Kang Dynasty film. Could you imagine a place where Shang-Chi has to go back in time to meet the Mandarin, understand what the Ten Rings are? Apparently, Shang-Chi 2 is called The Wreckage of Time, so it is kind of linked to Kang the Conqueror as well. So I think when we get a Mandarin What If episode, this this could be a good book to pick up. All right, that brings us now to the next movie we have to talk about for 2023. And of course, the big one that's coming out in May is going to be Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, a very, very exciting movie, the final installment of the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise. And the first book that we have to talk about for it, or books, I should say, is going to be Thor number 165 from 1969. And what is the significance of this? Well, that would be the first full appearance of the character known as him, AKA Adam Warlock. Now it has already been confirmed that Will Polter is going to be playing Adam Warlock in the film. We saw images of this character in the trailer. And I actually think that this is a very interesting key book. One that I think is going to do pretty well over the long term. It doesn't seem like they would bring in Adam Warlock and an actor like Will Polter for a one and done situation. It feels like the Guardians of the Galaxy is a very important team that Marvel would want to continue. I think Thor 165 is always going to be the money book simply because it is the oldest of the batch. It's the Silver Age version compared to that of Marvel premiere number one, where he actually takes up the name of Warlock and kind of dons the iconic costume that we know him to have. But I also do think that Marvel premiere number one is still a good book to have as well, if that's something that interests you. A great Bronze Age book, one that also is the first appearance of the Soul Stone, the first appearance of Counter Earth, which I do believe we will see in Guardians of the Galaxy number three. And it is also the storyline of High Evolution Evolutionary, turning him into Adam Warlock, which seems like that's going to have, you know, some connection to the film itself. Now, related to all this, of course, we have to talk about Thor number 134 from 1966. And what is the significance of this book? Well, this would be the first appearance of of the High Evolutionary, the big bad of Guardians of the Galaxy number three, the villain of the film. Now, it has already been confirmed that Chuck Woody Uwuji is going to be playing High Evolutionary, and I really think that this guy is going to knock it out of the park. He is, seems like a great actor, did a great job in Peacemaker, and has such a presence in the trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy 3. I really like this book overall. It's hard to say what the long-term future of the High Evolutionary is. Will he be a one and done? I certainly hope not. I do actually think that the High Evolutionary has a lot of ties to so many different touch points in the MCU. And if they want to keep this character around, even past this film, they can do a lot of stuff with him. All right, the next book we have to talk about is of course a fastball straight down the middle, but this one right here is Incredible Hulk number 271 from 1981. And what is the significance of this book? Well, of course, this is the first appearance of Rocket Raccoon in comic books. This would be his second overall appearance. Additionally, it is the first appearance of a character known as Lila, who would actually be the love interest of Rocket Raccoon, who we know is going to be making an appearance in this film because we saw her in the trailer. And if you guys want to know, Marvel Preview 7 is the magazine first appearance of this character. And it is my opinion that Rocket is a flagship character 
of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think that Rocket is one of Disney's most important superheroes, especially with the younger audience. And even though it's been speculated that Rocket is going to be possibly dying in this film, I actually think it's gonna be the opposite. I think that Rocket is gonna stick around. And I think that this character is going to be maybe the leader of the Guardians of the Galaxy team or take up the mantle moving forward. All right, the next book we have to talk about for Guardians of the Galaxy number three is of course gonna be Nova number eight from 2008. And what is the significance of this book? Well, this would be the first appearance of Cosmo the dog. Additionally, it would be the first appearance of Nowhere. But really, we are talking about this one for Cosmo. Now, I write there on the slide, cautious spec. On the one hand, I do think Cosmo is a pretty cool character, but this could be one of those books that, you know, is basically a quick flip, a quick spec book, maybe gets a little bit hot and then dies off. I mean, it's already been specced on in the market. Or it could be a book that really starts to grow over time that a lot of people start to like to hold, they want to collect it, because maybe Cosmo has a bright future in front of her. Hard to really say at this point, but it's definitely a book I thought would be worth pointing out to you guys as one to keep our eyes on when we get to this film. All right, the next couple books I want to talk about here are Avengers number 112 and Avengers number 257 from 1973. And what is the significance of these two books? Well, of course, 112 would be the first appearance of Mantis, and 257 would be the first appearance of Nebula. Now, I like these two books as far as what is the future of the Guardians of the Galaxy team going to look like? And I'm of the opinion that Mantis and Nebula are still going to be sticking around. I think of those actresses as being, you know, lifers in the MCU. And if you can find good copies at decent prices, I think that these are going to be strong books to hold on to for many years down the road. Now, the last two books to talk about for Guardians of the Galaxy number three are going to be kind of two tinfoil hat Pepe Sylvia Town. But the first one we have to talk about is Iron Iron Man number 54 from 1973. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of Madame McEvil, otherwise known as Moon Dragon, who of course you guys know to be the daughter of Drax. Now it has been rumored for quite some time that Moon Dragon might be appearing in the Guardians 3 film. Now I don't really know if that's actually going to come true. Perhaps it could be a post credit scene. It does feel like a lot of people are speculating that Drax might be dying in this film. Maybe we're going to get you know some imagery of his family. Who's going to be the one that picks up the mantle for Drax? Maybe it's going to be the Moon Dragon character. So I could see see this book having some effect in that film, perhaps in a post credit scene. Additionally, we have Captain Marvel number 17 from 2004. Now, Phi Lavelle has been another character rumored to be joining the Guardians of the Galaxy team for quite some time. Maybe we would see her in a post credit scenes in this film. You never really know, but one to keep our eye on for the future. All right, let's move on now to the next property scheduled to come out in 2023. And of course, we have to talk about Secret Invasion. Now, a little bit of a caveat, it's possible that Secret Secret Invasion comes out before Guardians of the Galaxy, but they haven't set it in stone yet. So I have right there on the slide, quarter two of 2023. We don't really know exactly what the dates are gonna be, but we can talk about the books. And the first book we gotta talk about is Astonishing X-Men number six from 2004. And what is the significance of this? Well, this will be the first full appearance of the character known as Abigail Brand. Now, Abigail Brand is the leader of the organization known as S.W.O.R.D. Incidentally, this book is also the first mention of that organization known as S.W.O.R.D. And this right here is currently the front-running character to be played by Amelia Clark. We had some leaks that kind of had some closed captions linking her to this character, but we don't necessarily know if it's all a ruse. Perhaps she is a scroll by surprise, and maybe she's just gonna be Abigail Brand at the start. And a lot of people are thinking that Amelia Clark might actually be playing Varenki, which of course brings us to this book right here, New Avengers number 40 from 2008. This would be the first appearance of Varenki, otherwise known as the Skrull Queen. Now, if you guys know the storyline of Secret Invasion, you guys would know that Varenki is the big bad of this crossover event, which leaves a lot of people to believe that this book is going to play a huge role in the show. We don't necessarily know if that's gonna be the case. Perhaps they want to change the storyline so that people are unsuspecting, but it is currently speculated that maybe Amelia Clark is gonna be Varenki, or it could also be Olivia Coleman to be revealed as Varenki. Now, the other interesting little spec book that relates to this, of course, is Meet the Scrolls number one from 2019. This would be the first appearance of 
of the Warners family, a Scroll family that is undercover. And it has been also rumored that Amelia Clark is playing a character in this family known as Gia. Now, of course, this would be another short-term spec in my opinion. I think a lot of these books, Astonishing X-Men 6, New Avengers 40, and Meet the Scrolls are all somewhat volatile. So I would definitely encourage people going for raw versions of the comics if these are ones that you want to pick up. Now, the other book we have to talk about for Secret Invasion is, of course, Incredible Hulk number 418 from 1994. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of the character known as Talos. Now, you guys remember Talos from the Captain Marvel film. That character was played by Ben Mendelsohn, who has been confirmed to appear in the Secret Invasion show. We saw him in the trailer. And I really do like Ben Mendelsohn as a long-term character in the MCU. I think that he was the best part of the Captain Marvel film in the Talos role. I think he's going to play an important role for Secret Invasion. Go for the raw, no need to get the graded version. You have two options. You can get the die cut cover or you can get the regular cover. I'm not really sure if the market has a preference, but I personally like the die cut. Now, the next book we have to talk about here is Ultimates number two from 2002. And of course, Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos number one from 1964. Now, Ultimates two is the first appearance of Nick Fury as Samuel L. Jackson. And Sergeant Fury number one is, of course, the first appearance of Nick Fury, the old Nick Fury. Now, of course, Nick Fury is going to be the lead of the Secret Invasion show. And Samuel L. Jackson, I think at this point, is a MCU lifer. I feel like Samuel L. Jackson is going to play this character forever and he's gonna have continued appearances. And if you're somebody out there that wants to own a Nick Fury, Samuel L. Jackson related book, I feel like these are the two ones to go for. Now, the next book we have to talk about for Secret Invasion is of course, Fantastic Four number two from 1962. And like another fastball down the middle, this right here is the first appearance of the scrolls. Of course, the scrolls are going to have a huge role in Secret Invasion, or at least you would think so. And the scrolls have been an important alien race in the Marvel comic universe for quite some time. Now, normally I wouldn't necessarily pick a book like this to talk about in this video, but I do think it is a good value buy considering that this is the second appearance of the Fantastic Four. Of course, we're not gonna get the Fantastic Four in 2023, but we are gonna get them at some point later on down the line. And I think that this is a really good book to buy, a great one to have for the collection. It's the last 10 cent cover, which makes it kind of special altogether. Which brings me to the last book I wanna talk about for Secret Invasion. And this book, of course, is Fantastic Four number 18 from 1963. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of Clort otherwise known as the Super Scroll. Now, Super Scroll is one of Fantastic Four's most iconic villains, and it's been a long time speculation that he might be the first appropriate villain to go up against Fantastic Four when we get them in the MCU. I mean, considering we're doing Secret Invasion here and we have all these scroll plot lines, it only makes sense to bring in Super Scroll. And currently we have an actor, otherwise known as Kingsley Ben Adir, set to play a character known as Gravik. And Gravik has been announced that he's basically a rebel leader leader of a group of scrolls, and we don't really know much more about that, but I wonder if Gravik is a cover name for him to be Super Scroll at some point later on in the future. We may not necessarily see the Super Scroll in Secret Invasion, but we could get the breadcrumbs that eventually lead to this character. All right, let's move on now to the next property set to come out in 2023, and it's going to be the first non-Marvel cinematic project that we are going to talk about. Of course, this one right here is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, brought to you by Sony Pictures, the sequel to the hit movie Into the Spider-Verse. And for this particular portion of the video, I wanna keep it to the basics. So of course we have to talk about Ultimate Fallout number four from 2011. And what is the significance of this book? Well, you guys know this one. This is the first appearance of Miles Morales. Now, Miles Morales, you guys know, is the star of the Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, across the Spider-Verse, and eventually in 2024, beyond the Spider-Verse, animated franchise. Miles Morales for a lot of people is the future of Marvel comic books. And for a lot of people, this is the all time modern grail to get. Now with the current market climate we are in, this book has had a major pullback from its all time record prices, which ironically makes this probably a good time to buy, especially when we get around to when this movie releases at some point in the middle of 2023. So I would definitely say, keep your eyes on this book, look for it as a good opportunity. If you're someone who is going to be having this one for the long term because not only are we going to get this film later on in the year we're going to get the third one 
in 2024. And I think it's a shoe in that we are eventually going to get a live action version of Miles Morales at some point in the future. So this is definitely a good book to get for the long term. On top of all that, of course, the other one we have to talk about is Edge of the Spider-Verse number two from 2014. And this will be the first appearance of Spider-Gwen. If Ultimate Fallout 4 is kind of the number one book of the modern age, this is a very, very close second. Spider-Gwen and Miles Morales are, of course, the two biggest modern creations in Marvel comic books, and I think both these characters have a long future ahead of them. Of course, Spider-Gwen is going to return in the film this year. She is also going to make an appearance in the third installment next year, and there's been a lot of rumors that she also will eventually have a live action appearance at some point in the future. Hell, you never really know. Maybe Emma Stone is going to show up with Andrew Garfield in Secret Wars and have a role in that. So you never really know with this book. Could be a good one for the short term and certainly a good one for the long term, but make sure you stick to those first prints. Now, the next book I want to talk about is an interesting one, Spectacular Spider-Man number 98 from 1984, and this would be the first appearance of the villain character known as Spot. Now, it has been confirmed that Spot is going to be the main villain of Across the Spider-Verse, and that is gonna be voiced by the actor known as Jason Schwartzman. It is also said that Spot is going to return in Beyond the Spider-Verse, which makes me a little bit more bullish on that character in this book overall. But again, be careful with this one. I would try to find a raw book. Make sure you get a good deal because you don't wanna be holding the bag, man. And speaking of bag, man, we have to talk about the other additional Spider characters that are gonna be showing up in this film later on in the year. Now, I picked out a few books here. Don't wanna belabor this one. I think all of these books are interesting, not necessarily ones I think, you know, you should go all in on. Uh, definitely ones that I think could be cool. Of course, we're talking about ASM number 10, first appearance of Spider-Punk, Marvel Spotlight 32, first appearance of Spider-Woman, Web of Spider-Man number 118, first appearance of Ben Riley, and ASM 365 and Spider-Man 2099 number one, first appearance of Spider-Man 2099. Now, one of the reasons why I highlight all of these books is because they are all voiced by famous actors, which makes me think that they will have future roles in this franchise later on down the road. But again, all of these books are ones I don't think you should overextend on. I definitely think you should wait for the right deal. All right, let's move on now to the next property coming out in 2023. And in the summer, we are going to be getting Loki season two. And this one is gonna be very interesting to keep our eyes on because we are getting a return of all of the cast from Loki season one, which makes me excited to talk about all of the books that were going crazy in 2021, like this one right here, Fantastic Four, number 353 from 1991. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of Mobius M. Mobius. And I think that this Mobius character is going to be very important in order to understand what is happening with all this time travel and Kang stuff. And it doesn't surprise me that we will see Owen Wilson also returning in Deadpool number three. So I actually think that Fantastic Four 353 has kind of a medium long-term future. Now, speaking of good books to pick up, of course, I have to talk about Journey into Mystery number 85 from 1962. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of the titular character of the show, otherwise known as Loki. This would also be the third appearance of the character known as Thor. And one of the most important blue chip 1962 first appearance books out there in the Marvel Silver Age. It's my opinion that this is probably one of the most affordable of those blue chips that came out in this particular year. I think it is a very attainable grail. And for that reason, I think it is a very good book to get your hands on because I do think that Loki continues to make himself an important character for Marvel comic books, pop culture, all things Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I think that this is an all-time great book. I could definitely see us having scenes with Doctor Strange and Loki in the future, you know, kind of talking about incursions and He Who Remains and Kang the Conqueror. So I think even after this show, this is gonna be a good book to have for many, many years down the road. All right, the next book we have to talk about for Loki season two is one that was, of course, very hot during Loki season one and now has had its pullback as well. But this one right here is Avengers number 23 
Three from 1965. And what is the significance of this? Well, this will be the first appearance of the character known as Ravona Renslayer. Now, you guys remember Ravona. She was the judge character, the friend of Mobius. And if you guys know the comic book storyline, you would know that Ravona is the love interest of Kang. So it feels like Ravona is going to have an important role in the MCU in the future. Speaking of other good books to add to the collection, of course, we have to talk about Avengers number 70 and number 85 from 1969. The first appearance of the Squadron Sinister for number 70 and the first appearance of the Squadron Supreme for 85. Now this right here has been heavily speculated on for Loki season two that we would be getting one of these versions of the team. Of course, Hyperion, Nighthawk, Dr. Spectrum, Wizard showing up, basically Marvel's version of the Justice League. But if we don't get them in Loki, there has been a lot of talk that we might still be getting them in some other MCU project down the line. But I would say if you're somebody out there who wants to add these two books to their collection, this would be probably a good time to look for them. Now, the next book we have to talk about for Loki season two is of course, Timeless Number One from 2021, the Umberto Ramos variant cover that features the character Ms. Minutes. Now, if you guys remember, Ms. Minutes was kind of the breakout character or at least kind of a hit character for Loki season one. And this would be the first time that they brought her on a comic book cover. She's actually never made an appearance in Marvel comic book continuity, but this was one of those books that definitely was specced on and bought heavily the week that it came out. And now we're prices sort of correcting, you know, out of sight, out of mind. This might be another good time to kind of keep your eye out for this particular book right here. Of course, you have to get the variant cover, the Ramos variant cover with her on it. And when we get to Loki season two, it does feel like they're gonna bring back Ms. Minutes. I think that has already been confirmed and she could be kind of a sleeper hit character that the MCU continues to use because of her character design, of course, one that sort of appeals to the kids. But I also have right there on the slide, cautious spec. You never really know with these kind of books. It really all depends on what you buy it for. So make sure you're out there in the wild digging in those bins. And the last book we have to talk about for Loki season two is another sort of cautious spec to talk about. But this one I bring up is Dark Reign, Young Avengers number one from 2009. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of Sylvie Lustin, the second Enchantress. Now, the reason I bring this up is because it is the closest version of the character Sylvie, the Loki variant that we got in the show. But we do know that Sophie DiMartino is going to play a major role in Loki season two. And if you're somebody out there that you know wants to own some kind of thing related to that character, this is probably your best bet. But with that being said, I would say, you know, this is a cautious short spec, not a long-term play because you don't really know how many people are looking for those Sylvie books. All right, let's move on now to the next property set to come out in July of 2023. And the movie that we have to talk about is of course the Marvels, the spiritual successor, the sequel to Captain Marvel, except this time we're bringing all three Marvel characters together. But the first one we have to talk about is the main one. This, of course, is Marvel Super Heroes number 13 from 1968, the first appearance of Carol Danvers. Now, Carol Danvers has many sort of split appearances depending on what version of the character you want to own. Of course, you have the Carol Danvers version. You get her first appearance as Ms. Marvel when she gets her superpowers in Ms. Marvel number one. And then in Avenging Spider-Man number nine, you have her first appearance as Captain Marvel, kind of the version we have come to know in current comic books and certainly in the movies. Now, for my money, I think that Marvel Super Heroes 13 it's always going to be the money book. Again, it has everything to do with age, less so to do with, you know, what version of the character. I think being the Silver Age book, that one is always going to command a premium over the other versions of the books. So I would say that's the one to kind of go for. It'll be interesting to see where this book goes. I mean, you know, you can't really do much worse at this point. This thing has basically been flat for many, many, many years. And if you're generally fairly bullish on the Captain Marvel character and the Marvels as a movie, you may want to pick this one up. Now, the second Marvel character we have to talk about comes from this book right here, Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number 16 from 1982. And this right here would be the first appearance of Monica Rambeau. Now, you guys remember Tayona Paris making her debut in the WandaVision TV show. She got her powers that Monica Rambeau has, the cosmic powers, and they're going to be bringing her back 
in the Marvel's film. Now, there is also the Mighty Avengers number one. That would be the first time that Monica Rambeau takes up the mantle of Spectrum. It's been my belief that they're going to be calling her Spectrum in the MCU for clarity purposes. But for me, the money book is still Amazing Spider-Man Annual 16. I mean, it is an ASM key. No matter how you slice it, ASM books are always going to be popular out there in the market. And based on where prices are now, seems like it could be a good opportunity if you are someone who is a fan of this character. Lastly, the last Marvel character we have to talk about is from this book right here, all new Marvel Now, point one, number one from 2014. This right here would be the first appearance of Ms. Marvel, otherwise known as Kamala Khan. This would also be the first appearance of her partner in crime, Bruno Corelli. You guys remember Bruno and Ms. Marvel Kamala Khan from the Ms. Marvel Disney Plus show. This is an interesting book, one that has had major pullbacks from its peak prices. And I would say that this is one that you probably want to play slow. I mean, Marvel is heavily invested in Kamala Khan, wanting her to be a success in pop culture. So it does feel like, you know, this one is probably going to be one for the long term, but it's sort of hard to figure out what the ceiling for this book is. Is there still a little bit of correcting to be done? Perhaps when we get to around this time of year in 2023, the prices will be at a good entry point once again, but it does feel like Ms. Marvel is going to have a major role in the MCU for many years down the line. So it does feel like this is an interesting book if you are a fan of the character. Now, the last book we have to talk about for the Marvels is a little bit more of a speckish book, but this one right here is Silver Surfer number 53 from 1991. And this would be the first appearance of Dar Ben and Al Dan two Kree soldiers, and it's currently been sort of rumored that the actress known as Zowie Austin is going to be playing the villain of this film, otherwise known as Dar Ben. So this could be an interesting book, one of those quick sort of short-term spec plays. Again, use caution with this one. Make sure you're out in those bins finding this one for a dollar or a couple dollars here and there because you never really know with this character. All right, the next property set to come out in 2023 comes later in the year around the fall time, and that one is going to be the Disney Plus series known as Ironheart. And of course, the first book we have to talk about for Ironheart is going to be Invincible Iron Man number nine from 2016. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first full appearance of the character known as Riri Williams. Now, you guys remember Riri Williams. Of course, she made her debut in the Wakanda Forever film. And this is going to be an interesting character, an interesting book to keep our eyes on. Now, one of the problems with Riri Williams as a character, she has kind of a lot of different keys all within the same time period that kind of dilutes the value and the prices for this book. She has a first cameo appearance. She has a first Rhea Williams as Ironheart. She has her first solo series. So there's a lot of different, you know, books and split values amongst all of these comics. But, you know, this one right here for my money is probably still the go-to book to have. I mean, like the Kamala Khan book, this one has seen a big pullback in the prices. So I would say that, you know, you have to sort of wait for the right deal with this one. But maybe by the time the show rolls around, the prices will have settled and it'll be a great time to find yourself a copy. Now, the next book we have to talk about for the show is actually The Hood Number 1 from 2012 and this would be the first appearance of The Hood, otherwise known as Parker Robbins. Now, The Hood has already been confirmed for this show. We've seen set photos of the actor Anthony Ramos playing this character, and it does feel like they're going for the sort of, you know, tech versus mysticism dichotomy in this particular show. And I do think that this is a very cool character. I love this storyline written by Brian K. Vaughn. You know, if you're out there in the wild looking for those raw comics, you know, try to find those higher grade versions of this one. And this could be a really good book depending on what they do for the long term. And it can certainly be a long term future for this character if, in fact, they bring in this one right here, which is the next book we have to talk about for Ironheart. Of course, I am talking about Silver Surfer number three from 1968 the first appearance of Mephisto. And apparently Mephisto will be played by Sasha Baron Cohen. Now you guys know I am super excited for this one right here. Not only do I think that this is a great book just to pick up for the Ironheart show, I really do believe in the long-term future and potential for Mephisto. As you guys know, he has so many connections to Wanda, Doctor Doom, Agatha Harkness, Silver Surfer, Fantastic Four. There are so many different storylines that they could actually do for this character. I've actually made mention that Mephisto would be a great major domo figure to play in Secret Wars, kind of taking that Mr. Sinister role, if you guys remember the Jonathan Hickman version 
of Secret War. So I really do like this book, not only for this year of 2023 for Ironheart, but I like this book for the long-term future of Mephisto, one of the great Marvel villain characters. All right, let's move on out to the next show set to come out in late 2023. And the next Disney Plus show that we have to talk about is the show known as Echo. And of course, the first book related to Echo is going to be Daredevil number nine from 1999, the first appearance of the titular character, otherwise known as Echo. Now, you guys remember Echo. She made her debut in the Hawkeye Disney Plus show. And this was one of those books like Ms. Marvel, like Riri Williams, that has had a big correction from those peak prices. But when we get to the end of the year, kind of around the Echo TV series, it does feel like where the prices are might be another good buying opportunity for this character because it feels like we're going to get a lot of storylines that not only come from this one, but lead into Daredevil Born Again that we're going to get in 2024. And I would be surprised if Echo doesn't also play a role in that. And one of the reasons for that relevance has to do with the next book we have to talk about, which is Amazing Spider-Man number 50 from 1967, the first appearance of the Kingpin, otherwise known as Wilson Fist. Now it has been confirmed that Vincent D'Onofrio is going to be returning in the Echo TV show series to play the Kingpin role. He is also going to be making an appearance in Daredevil Born Again the following year. And I think that Kingpin is going to be kind of the big bad of the MCU street level for many, many years down the road. But even outside of the MCU, I think ASM 50 is an all-time great book. I mean, it's a Spider-Man title. It's number 50. It's one of the most iconic covers there is in all of Silver Age of Marvel. And this is going to be a book that no matter when you buy it, it's always going to be a good time. And you might as well have a copy for when Vincent D'Onofrio returns in Echo. Now, the next book we have to talk about is kind of an interesting one. This is Bullseye number one from 2017, and this would be the first appearance of the organization known as the Black Knife Cartel. And it's currently rumored that the Black Knife Cartel is going to be the villainous organization in the Echo TV series. Now, this is more of a short-term spec, one that is probably just going to be a one-and-done villainous organization that has ties to Echo and the Kingpin. But I actually like this book because of the fact that it relates to this one right here, which is, of course, Daredevil number 131 from 1976. And this right here would be the first appearance of the character known as Bullseye. Now, you guys know Bullseye, one of the greatest street-level villains there is in Marvel comic books. While I don't necessarily think we're going to see Bullseye in Echo, I do think that the foundation will be laid for him as a character, and you know how the market is. The market likes to be on top of these types of things, and they might start to look for those Bullseye keys once we get to the Echo show. Now, similarly to Echo hinting at Bullseye, I also think that Echo could hint at this book right here, Amazing Spider-Man number 129 from 1974, the first appearance of the Punisher, a.k.a. Frank Castle. Now, like I mentioned, I think Echo is going to have a lot of plot lines that carry over into Daredevil Born Again. So I think that they're going to lay the foundation for the Kingpin. They're going to lay the foundation for Daredevil and Bullseye. And they also may lay the foundation for John Bernthal returning in the Daredevil series in 2024, which means Punisher is back on the menu, boys. And I think that if you are somebody who has always wanted ASM 129, based on where the prices are now, 2023 might be the year for you to pick this one up because I definitely think that John Bernthal will make an appearance in the MCU at some point in the future. I also have Alias number one on your slide. I also think it's possible that Kristen Ritter, Jessica Jones could maybe make an appearance as well in X or maybe leading in to Daredevil Born Again. But either way, I think that 2023 is going to be the year to pick up 129. All right, let's move on now to the third last property coming out in 2023. And we have in fall of 2023, X-Men 97, the animated series. Now, like I was saying with What If?, the animated shows don't quite move the market as much, but I do think that there are some interesting nostalgia books that could get kind of hot when we get the return of this cartoon. Starting with this one here, of course, we have to talk about X-Men Adventures number one from 1992, the first appearance of Morph and the first issue of the comic series based on 
the animated show. I think that this is a short-term spec. You know, go out there, find it in the wild. Don't overextend on this one. This has already been one that has been heavily speculated on in the market. But I do think that when the animated show rolls around, we will see this book in the limelight once again. Now, similarly, there is this book right here, Uncanny X-Men number 200 from 1985. We got a bunch of previews of the animated characters at San Diego Comic-Con, and one of them was Magneto, and he was in this costume right here where he debuts it in number 200. This is the trial of Magneto, and after this issue, Magneto becomes the head of the mutant school, which kind of begs the question, are they gonna do that storyline in X-Men 97? But this again would be another kind of short-term spec, one that I wouldn't necessarily you know, buy off of eBay, definitely go find those deals in the wild. Additionally, we have to talk about X-Men number 244 from 1989, first appearance of Jubilee. It wouldn't be X-Men 97 unless they made Jubilee a big character for that show. And I think that we could get a big nostalgia pop for this character. Again, I would actually say, make sure you go out there and find a raw copy on this one. Don't need to go ham on the graded prices. Make sure you get a good deal on this one because there are a lot of copies out there. Similarly, I think Avengers Annual Number 10 from 1981, first appearance of Rogue is also going to get a nostalgia pop. I think that Uncanny X-Men Number 266 from 1990, first full appearance of Gambit. We also got X-Men Annual Number 14, the first true appearance of Gambit. I'll let you guys decide which one you want. I personally would rather have 266, but regardless, I think Gambit is going to get a huge nostalgia pop from this show. I also think Uncanny X-Men number 221 from 1987, first appearance of Mr. Sinister, is also going to get a nostalgia pop and could be even the big bad of the series altogether. Either way, I think X-Men 97 is going to launch a lot of Copper Age books into the limelight. And the last two books of that ilk I wanna talk about for this show is actually New Mutants 87 and Uncanny X-Men number 282, the first appearance of Cable and the first cameo appearance and first cover appearance of Bishop. I think that these two books are very, very interesting because once we get the animated show, if they actually wanna tie it back into the live action version of the MCU, I think that they're gonna tie it in some kind of weird multiverse time travel sort of way. And it could be interesting if they have Josh Brolin play the voice of the Cable character, perhaps this show will lead into something that happens in Deadpool later on, or maybe we're gonna get some time travel shenanigans that lead to secret wars later on. All right, let's move on now to the second to last property we have to talk about for 2023. Incidentally, the second non-MCU related Marvel property set to come out in late October. Oh, Sony, what are we gonna do with you? Well, of course, we can buy the books related to your movie. And of course, the first one we have to talk about is Amazing Spider-Man number 15 from 1964. And what is the significance of this? Well, of course, this is the first appearance of the villainous character known as Craven the Hunter. This is also the second appearance of Chameleon. Chameleon is also going to be playing a role in this film. Is it going to be a train wreck like Morbius was? We don't really know, but I do think that even outside of all that, Craven is still a great character. This is an early ASM book, and anytime you buy an early ASM book, generally speaking, you're always going to be doing good with it. So I do think that based on where prices are now, this might be a good book to pick up later on in the year. Additionally, we have ASM number 209 from 1980, first appearance of Calypso. Calypso is also confirmed to be making an appearance in the Craven movie. I would definitely say go for a raw version of this book. Now, similarly, there's Spectacular Spider-Man number 116 from 1986. This right here is the first appearance of The Foreigner, and the actor Christopher Abbott has been confirmed to be playing The Foreigner. Now, I don't necessarily think that this is a good long-term spec. I think this is definitely a short-term one, but one of the reasons why I wanted to bring it up is because The Foreigner is in fact the love interest of Silver Sable. And if we're talking about Silver Sable, we gotta talk about Amazing Spider-Man number 265 from 1985, the first appearance 
of Silver Sable. Now, Silver Sable has been heavily rumored to be a character making an appearance in some kind of Sony movie. If it's not the Craven film, which, you know, with the connections with the foreigner, you would think that that would be a possibility. But if it's not that film, it might be in Madam Web that comes out later in 2024. So ASM 265 has been kind of an interesting book and one that I think might be worth a good pickup if you can find it for a good price. But there's a lot of connections with Silver Sable and sort of, you know, the country of Russia, which of course has connections to Craven, and of course has connections to this next character that is sort of a tinfoil hat Pepe Sylvia town. But this one right here, Amazing Spider-Man number 41 from 1966 is the first appearance of Rhino. And given the Russian connections to Craven, it's been heavily rumored that maybe Rhino is going to make an appearance in the Craven film. I mean, for a long time, people were speculating that Rhino was going to be showing up in Amazing Spider-Man 3, and we were going to get that Sinister Six team, but we never actually got that payoff. Could you imagine if they actually had Rhino show up in the Craven movie, and then they put together the team of Morbius, Vulture, Craven, and Rhino, and they start to build the Sinister Six in that universe of Sony. So that would be really interesting as well, which takes us now to the last property set to come out in 2023. We are talking late 2023, quarter four of 2023, so late that it might actually get pushed to 2024. But the show that we're talking about is, of course, Agatha House of Harkness, otherwise known as Agatha Coven of Chaos. And of course, the first book we have to talk about for this show is Fantastic Four number 94 from 1970. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of the title character, Agatha Harkness. Now, you guys remember Agatha. It was Agatha all along in WandaVision, played by Katherine Hahn. And I actually think that Agatha has a long-term future in the MCU, specifically due to the fact that she is being played by Katherine Hahn. Now, the next book we have to talk about is Young Avengers number one from 2005. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of the Young Avengers, but more specifically, the first appearance of Wiccan, one of the sons of Wanda, who is rumored to be showing up in Agatha House of Harkness. Now, if you guys remember, Wiccan is the one that actually has the mythical powers that Wanda has. So it makes sense that they would be bringing him into the show. And we know that the MCU has been building up the Young Avengers for quite some time, but like Miss Marvel, like Riri Williams, like Echo, this is a modern book that you have to be careful with. Make sure you go for a raw copy, make sure you find a good deal. Because while I do think that this is a key for the future, your entry point is very important for a book like this. Now, the next book we have to talk about for the Agatha show is actually Fantastic Four number 185 from 1977, and this would be the first appearance of Nicholas Scratch, otherwise known as the son of Agatha Harkness. Now, it has been rumored that Aubrey Plaza is going to be playing some kind of role in the Agatha show. We don't really know who that is, but there has been speculation that what if it is a gender-swapped version of Nicholas Scratch, like a Nicole Scratch, and maybe it would be the daughter of Agatha who is trying to usurp her mother in some kind of way. But regardless, Fantastic Four number 185 is a very interesting book for that reason. And I also have Fantastic Four number 186, which is the first appearance of the Salem Seven, a group of villainous witch characters that are controlled by Nicholas Scratch. And I think that these two books have some kind of correlation to what story they may pull from from the Agatha show. Now, aside from which characters, the next book I think is interesting to keep your eye on for the Agatha show is actually Strange Tales number 169 from 1973. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of Brother Voodoo, otherwise known as Dr. Voodoo or Jericho Drum. Now, Brother Voodoo has been heavily speculated to be coming to the MCU for quite some time. A lot of people thought that he would be showing up in Doctor Strange, that didn't happen, but it does make sense that if they're going to bring in Brother Voodoo, the Agatha Harkness show makes a lot of sense to do that. And one of the interesting things about the Agatha show is that it's been rumored that they are filming scenes in New Orleans. And what do you have in New Orleans? Well, you have a lot of that kind of voodoo spirituality. And if they bring in Jericho Drum here, I think that this is going to be a good book to hold on to for the long term. And speaking of good books for the long term, the last two books that we have to talk about 
for this what books to spec on for 2023 before it's too late are these two mega keys right here of course i'm talking about avengers number 57 and x-men number four from 1964 the first appearance of vision in avengers 57 and the first appearance of the scarlet witch Wanda Maximoff in X-Men number four. Now, I don't think that we are going to be seeing Vision or Wanda in the Agatha show, but you know how it is. I think that those two characters may be mentioned in the Agatha show, may have relevance to the plot lines, being that Agatha was in WandaVision. And by the time we get to that time of year leading into 2024, I think the market will start to look at these books once again because I don't think we are done with Vision or the Scarlet Witch. We will definitely see these two characters again. And I think both of these books are not only good for the Agatha show, not only good for the MCU, but good for the long term. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed that video. It was definitely a long one. I am very excited of what is to come for the comic collecting hobby in 2023. I hope you all have a very wonderful New Year's Day. Drop me a like, comment, subscribe if you're enjoying the content, and I'll see you in the next video.